and I'll let I'll let you kick it off, David. Okay, slide two. Okay, so welcome to our webinar. Uh, we're uh, hosted by DEMA New England, which is a chapter of DEMA International. Uh, you know, primarily Connecticut and Massachusetts, where most of well, it's a, anyway, we're a premier educational networking event. Um, host a lot of uh, webinars. We try to, uh, we have our DM bot, the Data Management Book of Knowledge, and, and we try to arrange training uh, and education certification around that. We do have a website, damanewengland.org. And membership, uh, you know, gets you for your discounted admission, educational or networking events, a growing knowledge base at the member only section, including specialized videos and uh, networking and the like. Okay, so we're, we're moving on. Oh, oh, well, that's, that's me. That's what I do. Um, and, uh, I, and, uh, you know, that's sort of the, that's the end of the meeting. Uh, Great. Slide. Okay. Over to me. So we're going to talk about what we call the data centric revolution and how that ties into to uh, low code, no code, model driven, et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to start though with a question I get from a lot of executives, which is where did all these silos come from? So we decided to do a little bit of research and uh, came up with this answer. A lot of silos come from the Northern Metal fabric Fabricators in Wisconsin, USA. And they said, no, 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 not those silos. I, we mean that all these data silos we have in our enterprises, you know, we have, we have thousands of them and we're trying to figure out where did they come from and what, how do they keep springing up? So we placed hidden microphones in conference rooms and, and studied this as an anthropologist might and found out where silos come from. Here's what we found. We found out that somebody has a business problem. Some metric is down, sales are off, margins are squeezed, some problem, and they say, we have to do something. So they will convene a executive committee and they'll talk about it for a while. And you know, sometimes it's an organizational problem, sometimes it's a cultural problem, but very often, it's an information system problem. So they convene a subcommittee who studies the problem for a while. And then they feel like they have a decision to make about how to solve this problem. And it used to be the decision was the classic build or buy. You know, should we build a solution to solve this problem or should we just go buy one, buy a package? Nowadays, there's the third option. You can rent a solution. You know, software as a service is essentially paying monthly to solve that problem. So they think that's the fundamental decision they're making. But actually, this is an, an as far as the economics of what's really going on, those are non-decisions because all three of these end up in exactly the same place. Every one of those solutions has an arbitrarily different data model behind it. It doesn't matter whether you build the solution, whether you go buy it, you very often get a model that you know, came from a German factory 30 years ago with all kinds of strange acronyms. And, or, or if you rent something, that's got a data model. So every one of these solutions has its own completely arbitrary. All the names are different, the structure is different, everything's different. And that is what creates a silo because the data in that application is now disconnected from every other piece of data that you have. That's how, that's where silos come from. Clients we work with have typically have thousands of silos. It's, it's uh, surprising the, the harder you look and the longer you look, the more there are, they're just all over the place. Um, and nowadays, you know, with software as a service, it's, it's, we're getting much better at creating silos. Although getting better at creating silos is actually not a, not a skill we should want to have. So is it really that bad, all these silos? Well, <clears throat> right off the bat, it's, it's chewing up almost half now and soon more than half of your IT budget. Because once you create all these silos, you spend all your time trying to put everything back together again. 
Some of it's attaching one application to another or the applications to the data warehouse or the data lake or the data whatever um, acronym or, uh, or fad you're working on this year. So it's, it's a huge deal. And it's much bigger than even this slide suggests. The, the, the overspend on IT because of this is many orders of magnitude. It, it, the, the further I get into it, it sounds unbelievable, but everything we've seen says, no, 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 this is real. This is an understatement, if anything. So anyhow, it used to be when we go into clients, we would construct an as-is diagram of their, um, of their existing systems. And here's all the systems and here's how they're interfaced. And this one connects to this one. And, and some of these were almost comical how, how bad they got. But finally, you know, one of our clients said, look, we don't need somebody to draw that picture. We know it's a mess. So I thought, well, maybe I'll just have an artist create uh, essentially a composite. Here's, here's what most people's architectures look like. Um, and then you can figure out how yours is different than this. Um, you know, this is based on, on real architectures that we've seen. Uh, and there it is. And if you've been in a large enterprise, you kind of recognize that stuff down there at the bottom. That's your, that's your data warehouse. The, right above that, that's how you're feeding it. Maybe Kafka these days. You've got Snowflake in the lower right-hand corner because that's the new thing. Big hairball in the middle is probably ERP and being fed through various other channels. You got a new web front end and the digital transformation and all that stuff. But really, you know, they all kind of look like this. Very expensive, very brittle, not where you want to be. So it's made up a lot of legacy systems, which create the data silos. Then people have sort of kind of duct tape them back together and the, and the integration is even more brittle than the legacy systems themselves. And then, you know, there's almost always whatever the new technology, you know, this, this year it's Snowflake. You gotta have Snowflake if you want, want to improve your resume. Last year it was Kafka, before that it was Talend or it's always machine learning. One of the guys on the call said they're working on machine learning. So there's, there's always something else added into that, but um, that's basically, what an enterprise looks like, um, but it doesn't have to. That's what most enterprises look like. There's a very, very small number that don't look like that. So we're gonna get into the thick of this, but by now you're probably getting the idea that I'm pretty opinionated. I guess I am. So where did my opinions come from? Um, I founded this current company in the year 2000. We had had a dot-com in the 90s, as everyone did, and, and David sort of alluded to it a bit. Uh, we had built, patented, we're using a very, the pretty much first pure model-driven environment. It, it was pre-semantic. We used the idea of semantics, but implemented it in, in an object-oriented database. We built a bunch of healthcare applications. We had revenue, we had clients. We were not profitable. We had to go public in the spring of 2000. And, uh, you know, we were in registration. We had the underwriters. But if you recall the dot-com bomb, bust, balloon, whatever it was, uh, happened. So we were, and we couldn't get out of our technology because it was in the, the smoldering ruins of this company. So we just decided to start consulting, uh, decided to take what we learned about semantics and apply it to enterprise information systems. Our good fortune was the very following year, Tim Berners-Lee, the guy who invented the World Wide Web, came out with something called the Semantic Web. We thought, man, we're right in front of this thing. This is going to be great, just like the World Wide Web. But frankly, nothing happened. Year or two after that, I wrote uh, my first book, Semantics and Business Systems, which was just making the case why you should think deeply about what things mean before you try and design something. I think it's still a sensible idea. Um, through this period, we were mostly doing traditional consulting, at least uh, we appeared to. Behind the scenes, we were doing all this semantics, learning our craft, teaching classes. We eventually started this uh, conference that had a very big draw, and, and therefore we ended up getting to know everybody that was in this industry. Right about in the middle of that time period, or actually early in this, this time period, some, of our, some clients, actually wanted an ontology, which is a semantic model of your data. And we started building them and got quite good at it. 
But then we realized they couldn't, they weren't doing anything with it. It was becoming shelfware. So about 10 years ago, we started helping, holding people's hands, helping them through the implementation and getting it onboarded and all that kind of stuff. And right around that time, I wrote a book called Software Wasteland, which is just makes the case for just how bad is it now? And answer, real bad. And then the first, as David suggested, there was going to be a trilogy. The first of the of the solution was the data center revolution. That's what we're going to talk about today. Two of the other parts of that trilogy, uh, data centric pattern language, I think is still going to evolve into a podcast. So that's a bit on hold. And the data centric architecture uh, is now a conference. And that makes more sense. It's a very living every year. It changes a bit. Um, bunch of practitioners coming together about what, what we should do. There's now a fourth book in that trilogy, which is good because the middle two are missing. Um, as we've started working this, you realize we have to solve accounting. So there's gonna be a data centric accounting book, writing it with an accounting professor. It's, it's very fascinating. The deeper I, about halfway through it now, deeper I get into it, the more profound it seems to be. I wouldn't, and I, I've implemented a lot of accounting systems in my career, and I wouldn't have guessed where this was going to end up. Um, so the company, everything we've done for 21 years has been about semantics and knowledge graphs. We've built at least 50 enterprise ontologies. There's 27 of us now, but um, we're probably one of the largest collections of these kind of people. And we create and maintain and make freely available an upper ontology that's called GIST. It's on our website. You'll see it at the end of the presentation. And um, just to give you an idea who's on this journey, at some level or not, these are people who have worked with us, they're doing some of this, and here's some other uh, smaller, either smaller companies you haven't heard of that are doing this, or larger companies who, you know, we've worked with, but we haven't gotten them very far on that journey. So anyhow, that's me. Let's get back to what we're going to talk about. My thesis is there's, there's two... There's two roads here. There's the, the road, the well-traveled road to the right and the road less traveled off there to the left. This road, the, the default path that everybody gets on, we call it the application-centric quagmire and the castle on the hill, data-centric. We're gonna distinguish those. Uh, when, when you're in the quagmire, you know, the more you struggle, the deeper you go. Every project is, is work and it's hard and, um, but let's, you know, let's make this a little bit more specific. There's some incredibly classic over the top examples, but also some more mundane ones, but we see this every place we go. I was sitting at my desk minding my own business several years ago and one of my developers came in and said, I just heard about a system that has 500 million lines of code. What kind of system could possibly need that amount of code? I said, I don't know, what is it? He told me it was healthcare. I got, it literally was the week it was launching, whenever that was. And we said, well, get a pad of paper. Let's sit down and see what it is. And we stepped through it screen by screen, writing down what it did. And we got to the end of it. We went, that's it. Uh, that's, you know, tens of thousands of lines of code if you're sloppy and a few thousand if you're really model driven. I mean, that, this is ridiculous. Um, the And by this point, they'd already... The $93 million project had already become 500 million. Since then, it's up to 2 billion. Um, that same week, I happened to be at a conference and met the CEO of a company called Top Coder, where they um, have these little code X prize, very many X prizes for difficult problems. They give it to a team, two or three teams, and they compete against each other to see who can solve it the best. And I said, You're not going to believe this, but healthcare.gov is a top coder sized problem. He thought it was a pretty cool idea. We were gonna go look for a sponsor because somebody has to put up the prize money, but we were thinking 50 grand or hundred grand. Um, but before we could even get to that, we stumbled across something called healthsherpa.com. And I went to their website, in fact, uh, shortly, there, shortly after the healthcare.gov one, much better experience, faster, same exact same answer. Um, and I got curious about it. You know, did you also spend $500 million? No, this is the entire team. In fact, it was about half this at the time I first did it. I had several interviews with the CEO, the guy in the middle in the front there, his name's George. 
uh, about how that what they did, how they did it. You know, about half of this team built the equivalent in a in literally about six or seven weeks, and it actually performs better than um, healthcare.gov itself. Uh, I, I found out about a project in Australia, in, in Victoria province, where they, they, the police cars had cameras on their dashes. What they wanted was a software project that would use the camera, take pictures of license plates, and automatically, while you're driving around, read the license plate, hit a database, and find out if it's stolen or expired. Um, a developer down in Australia named Tate Brown looked at that. And this, by the way, became an $86 million project. This developer thought, gee, I wonder how much of that you could do with open source. It turns out this is about half the solution. The, re the remainder of the solution is one more page of code. He put it in his own car with a camera, was driving around, you know, finding people with expired license plates. Um, I actually sent him a copy of my book because I thought this so uh, uh, encapsulated what, what, what the book was about. He was a little afraid to open it. He got this unsolicited package. He, he later said in his blog, I thought it might be full of anthrax because the, the integrators on that project may be out for me. But anyhow, another idea just how, how far out of whack things are. In Canada, they, they put out a project bid uh, to register all the rifles in Canada. And there's only about a rifles. I forgot a million dollar project, although that's a bit of a uh, false idea. It was going to be a $109 million project and they're going to make 107 million on the registration fee. So net net, it was going to be 2 million. An amazing amount of precision as usual with these things. Um, it eventually became, I think, a billion and a half dollars when they when they finally canceled it. But this is a ridiculously simple system. There's, you know, whatever it is, eight million rifles, and you just need serial numbers and models and who owns it. And, you know, God, you could almost do it in, in a bunch of spreadsheets, but, um, and all kinds of other. We hired a guy who had just come off a project at FootJoy where they spent 10 years implementing an ERP system. For a company that makes golf balls and, and golf shoes, um, we worked with several investment banks who've spent, you know, hundreds of millions on projects that get flushed. And I mean, this is literally the state of the art in large enterprises. The question is what what keeps this going? And we think there's two things going on here. You have to really get at the root cause if you're going to solve this. One is complexity and the other we call just disintegration. You know, why do we have to have integration? It's not essential, it's accidental. So every time we look, we see something that's at least 10 and often a hundred times as complex as it needs to be. That's in an individual application. And if you have a thousand applications, the system of systems is 10,000 times or a hundred thousand times more complex than it needs to be. Some of these numbers, I'm going to tell you that are even I have a tough time to believe them. Um, we work with a partner that does data profiling in large enterprises, and they worked with a large telecom company. And by the time they were done, they discovered that they were managing 500 million columns, not 500 million rows, you know, and their various systems and data sets and all this stuff they had. 500 million columns, which is approximately 499.99 million more than they need. So we worked with a, with a company that makes electrical devices. They had a complex product catalog. There's a small part of it. It had about 700 tables, 7,000 attributes, but it was managing all the characteristics, everything you had to have on your website, the prices they were selling it in 140 countries. You know, it was relatively complex, but when we built the semantic graph version of this and we ran a query, we were kind of surprised because everything that was in that system was in the graph, but only 46 classes and 36 properties. In other words, there's, there's an example, almost not quite 100 to 1 reduction in complexity. And there's something amazing that happens when you reduce the complexity that much because the system, like the previous system, requires a lot of experts to know which tables to join and where to go and what to do. A system with 82 concepts, you can pretty much learn over the weekend. So it's a world of difference. 
and actually there's more functionality in the new system. We, we were able to do uh, product compatibility in a way that they couldn't do with their existing system. It was just too complicated to figure it out, but you drop the complexity and there you go. We worked with a company that sold data for a living. Uh, this representation on the bottom was meant to be their, their hundreds of um, various APIs, data sets, all these things they sell. They did an inventory. Finally, it was frustrating them so badly. Those little angle brackets in the middle represented the inventory of 150,000 attributes in their various systems. And their problem was they were trying to figure out how to migrate from one system to another. Up there at the top, after we studied this for a while, we realized the whole thing, it wasn't much more than a few hundred concepts. So the 150,000 was a bit of overkill, but we had to invent this thing in the middle here because it was, it was almost impossible to convert one data product to another. Each had about a thousand attributes and they're all slight, similar, but different. And you needed two experts. And so we just ended up creating this, this structure where they could map what was similar, what was different. Um, another 300 fold reduction in complexity. And it's not just giant companies who worked with a multi-level marketing firm that had, um, had 2,500 tables and 25,000 attributes in their online ordering system, which was hilarious when you consider they only sold 2,500 products. How do you, how you need 2,500 tables to sell 2,500 products? You know, if you just put them all in one table, it'd be a lot simpler. But I mean, there is some complexity to multi-level marketing. They have some complex genealogy things, but um, you know, almost a thousand to one, or no, I guess that's a hundred to one complexity. But even the simplest system we ever came across at the Washington State Secretary of State, their existing, and you know, they just register companies and, and charities and a few other things. Uh, here is the sum total. They had three or four existing systems, a few thousand attributes. Then the new system had just a few hundred. Um, so even, even what appear to be simple systems are far more complex than they need to be. So that's half the problem. The other half, we call it disintegration. It's as if people were really trying hard to disintegrate information that should be as one. Um, we work for a workers' compensation insurance company, and they had hundreds of systems. <clears throat> and every time they implemented a system, every once in a while, there, the system would involve receiving money from someone. So they had a elevator permitting system. So you had to pay for the permits. And they had a, you know, if you overpaid somebody, a, a claimant on a worker's compensation, you had to get some money back. They called that claimant overpayment. And they had, turned out there was 23 ways to keep track of money that other people owed them. And as you can imagine, that created all kinds of revenue recognition problems and, and complexity and everything else, you know, it's just, and nobody intentionally sat down and said, let's create 23 ways of doing the same thing, but that's exactly what happens. And if you don't have a way of seeing that, you can't correct it. We worked with one of the biggest firms that does Wall Street's back office. Um, they have three major systems and hundreds of small systems that are doing the exact same thing, except one of them does it for fixed income, one of them does it for North American equities, and the other one does it for derivatives and worldwide and, and um, currencies and things like that. But essentially, the whole system just does uh, settlement confirmation and or confirmation settlement and, and uh, uh, corporate actions, things like that. But it was mind boggling how these three systems that do effectively the exact same thing, confirm a trade, settle the trade, take care of corporate actions, um, and keep track of accounts and positions. A, it could be complex, but <clears throat> could be so dissimilar, especially these last couple of things, they were implemented at different levels of abstraction to where one of them, all the tables were, were you know, financial instruments and things like that. The other one, everything was a table pointing to a table, pointing to another table. And, and on you go. Anyway, I'm just reiterating the current state of things. Uh, I want to suggest this isn't inevitable. There is another way we call it becoming data centric. 
Um, I know it sounds, there's all kinds of buzzwords going around right now. <clears throat> there's the data lake, there's data fabric, there's data mesh, there's the data lake house. That's the newest one if you haven't caught that one. Um, so I'm just gonna distinguish what we're talking about here from all those things. I don't wanna spend a lot of time with them. Um, but the central idea is, is start with the data model, the data that is ultimately gonna be shared and the data that the enterprise runs off of. Don't start with a business function that you're gonna automate because if you start with the process, it looks like data is a byproduct or, or, or worse of the process and that it's owned by the process. And you know, that's what creates the silo. And the scope is the enterprise. The scope of the model isn't an individual application. If you really want to get past this unintentional disintegration, you have to change the scope to where you can. So this is kind of a, a word sandwich, but it's we've been using it for quite a while and it works pretty well. And I'm gonna I'm gonna piece this apart, but this is our definition of being data centric, that your the functionality you build or that you use is loosely bound. You know, it is bound in some way. There is application functionality, but to a single, simple, extensible, federatable, universal, shared, and directly implementable model. And that directly implementable is where we get to the model driven low code, no code. Um, but let's fill in some of the blanks before we get there. When we say single to distinguish in a traditional enterprise architecture, there's one data model per application. Therefore you have thousands of data models. We're talking about in this at the core, there's a single model, hundreds of concepts, <clears throat> not thousands of concepts, and certainly not thousands of models. That's where this thing is gonna start from. The second part of this is that it's simple. Like we said earlier in a traditional enterprise, every application has thousands of concepts. The enterprise therefore has millions of concepts that people have to learn. And by the way, the average high school graduate knows 20,000 concepts and has a vocabulary of 20,000 words. The average college graduate, 40,000. Think about that when you think about how an enterprise has to bring a bunch of people in and learn millions of things. It's really not happening. Um, in a data centric architecture, every place we've gone, the core has somewhere around 500 to 1000 concepts. That's to cover pretty much everything the enterprise does. Not all the specific uh, variations down in the division and stuff, but that which holds it all together. This idea of being extensible. Um, in a traditional enterprise, there's no mechanism for extending a model. You, you, that's why people keep creating <coughs> more uh, applications. Here, our little graphic here suggests, you know, if you have the enterprise core ontology is what is future-proofing what you're doing and what holds everything together. You go into some specific domain. In this example, I said, let's say hand tools, you know, that's a special kind of inventory. Most of the shared concepts are in the core. When you go over to the next ontology, fresh produce, you can use everything that was already in the core, but now we're adding things like use by dates that weren't in the hand tools. But, but really what we, what we find is very small additions give you a lot of extra capability. The idea of uh, being federatable in a traditional architecture, um, a query system only accesses data in its own database. So people have in their heads, have got this whole idea that everything has to be co-located. That's why data warehouses came to be the way they were. We lift data from the hundreds or thousands of systems and put it in one place in Teradata or Snowflake or wherever it is, <clears throat> because if you co-locate it, maybe you've got a hope of querying over it. But of course, that all that lifting and moving and copying um, in the data centric architecture, the idea is no, you don't have to, you can co-locate some of it and there's some, <clears throat> excuse me, there's some guidelines for what you should co-locate and what you should leave where it is. But we, we think of this core model as a lens. And if you've mapped down to the, the data where it is, you can query using a small number of concepts, get access to the larger corpus of data. The idea that it's universal, um, you know, for 20 years, people in the data warehousing community have been saying, you know, the hard problem is 
integrating structured and unstructured data. Well, it turns out this approach um, does that kind of natively. In the upper right-hand corner there, we've got relational databases. We turn those into graphs. I'll talk in a minute about what a graph is. In the upper left, we've got semi-structured HTML, XML, things like that. <clears throat> in the lower left, that's meant to be a um, social network like LinkedIn or something like that. That's already natively a graph. In the lower right, unstructured data, which they're now pretty good techniques for turning that not only into triples, but into triples that conform to your model. And therefore, you can link data in structured and unstructured data. That's why we call that a universal model. Um, the idea that we're sharing, we're not only sharing um, date, metadata, we're also sharing data itself. <coughs> In a traditional system, we share data by co copying and transforming. We take the customer record out of the CRM system and put it in the ordering system, but we have to change it in order to do that. And then we move it somewhere else for accounts receivable and you know, on you go. Um, literally, once you've express some knowledge in this graph format, it's shareable as is. We'll talk about that a little bit later. I may have to get a sip of water here in a minute. I'm going pretty fast. And then the final idea is that this model is directly implementable. You know, for decades, uh, even I bought into this idea, you have to build a conceptual data model, you convert that into logical data, model. you convert it into physical data model, and you implement it. And anytime you want to change anything, you're supposed to go back and you know go through this whole process. But of course, nobody does because that's a lot of work and you're in a hurry. <clears throat> but it turns out in these in this data centric world, the conceptual, logical, and physical models are all the same. And once you've modeled person, it doesn't change. You go through um, because it's a much more flexible architecture. I'm going to grab a sip of water. Be back in just a second. Thank you, and I'm back. Okay, so if that's the destination, how do we get there? Um, we think there's three key legs to this stool, if you will. Semantics in the green at the top, graph databases in the blue at the bottom, and model-driven everything. That's the low-code, no-code stuff. So let's start with the knowledge graph. Um, what a graph database gives you is, is flexibility. Uh, it's interesting when relational databases first came on the scene, they were uh, far less efficient than their predecessors, codicil databases and, and hierarchical databases. But <clears throat> they had the extra flexibility, which eventually it's, you know, is what caused them to be as popular as they are. Um, truth is, relational, just by ossification has become less and less flexible and knowledge graphs, as we'll see in a minute, have a lot of inherent flexibility to them. It's this knowledge graph and the graph database that gives you the integration almost for free. We'll see this in a second here. And this is how we're gonna get rid of the silos. So here's what a, a graph database, on the right here, imagine this is a relational table, you know, um, secret agents, if you will. <clears throat> and as with almost every table, there's a ID, you know, that's the primary key, James Bond, you know, it's the second row there. What a graph database does is says, instead of storing stuff in tables, we're going to study every, store every fact we have as a, uh, they call it a digraph, but a directed graph, node edge node. In this case, the one node is the node that represents agent 007. So I've got a colon, that's kind of a hint as to what's coming next. Um, at the other end is, is just his last name. And then what connects them is, you know, the, almost, it's really the column heading. You can imagine that each factoid is a cell in a spreadsheet. At first, this sounds like it's going to be inefficient, but it turns out that by collapsing all the unnecessary complexity, it becomes a lot more efficient. But let's see where this goes. If you put, pick out another from another table or unstructured database or whatever, another factoid that says <clears throat> 007 was assigned the, this particular Rolex watch, 
Um, you know, we didn't have to already have a data structure that said agents can be assigned things. And we can find out that the, the Rolex watch had a Garrett, you know, that piano wire you can take somebody's head off with. <clears throat> where, I don't think I have a slide for this. No. Um, but where the integration almost for free comes from in this example back here, you know, 007 representing James Bond is um, hyper local information. The fact that 007 means James Bond only means that in this particular column called ID, in this particular table called agent, in a particular database. At any place else you find 007, it could be anything. You know, in, in the in the commissary, it could be a ham sandwich, or it could be a widget. It could be anything. And furthermore, <clears throat> in another table or another database where we make the assignment, the column heading isn't going to be ID, it's going to be assigned to or something else. And some human has to know, oh, wait, assigned to an ID. I join those in SQL. You know, so you have to spend all your career putting tables back together. This little colon in front of the 007 is, is sort of a hint. I don't have a lot of time or space on this on PowerPoint, but we convert every factoid into, into a globally unique identifier. And in particular, a globally unique identifier attached to a domain name that you own, or you can use, you know, if you're using somebody else's data, you use their identifiers. But what, what that means, if we, if we construct these identifiers correctly, when you find 007 and you know that it's not a ham sandwich, that it's the agent, and you put it in, I'm just going to say this is HTTP colon slash slash uh, Her Majesty's Secret Service dot UK slash agent underscore 007. You know, that's what they, they look almost exactly like URLs, but they are URIs, universal identifiers. Um, when the system sees those, it doesn't need a human to snap those together. It says two globally unique identifiers are identifying the same thing. I will attach them together. And that's where the integration almost for free comes from. Now, here's a warning. <clears throat> Last year, well, I guess it's two years ago now, uh, Gartner declared that in the hype cycle for artificial intelligence, which is already hyped, um, knowledge graphs were at the peak of the this overhyped sector. And of course, what that means is it's about to go down this, you know, like this roller coaster into the trough of disillusionment. Um, but fear not, the trough of disillusionment is just created because once something gets hyped, a whole bunch of people jump onto it, claim they can do it, can't do it. They screw up their implementations. And that's where, that's why people get disillusioned. And when you come out the other end, um, the handful of people who knew what they were doing survive and, and everything's fine. That's what's going to happen here. So let's go to the second uh, leg of the three-legged stool. Semantics is a study of meaning. Uh, the W3C has a standard called OWL, which is um, stands for the web ontology language. It's a little dyslexic. Um, if you build a model in OWL, that's called an ontology. And part of the, the skill and discipline is by spending a real lot of time thinking through what things actually mean, that's where simplification comes from. It's, it's very surprising. You know, in a traditional design, you go interview subject matter experts and whatever they tell you, you write down, you think that's a class or a property and pretty soon complexity arises. The other thing a semantic model will do for you is it can create new information if you take data plus knowledge. I don't have a lot of time to go into that right now, but um, trust me on that one. And then finally, model-driven everything. We, uh, we first got into this. We were designing applications in healthcare. And we designed them in kind of an interesting way where <clears throat> almost everything about the application was configured. And our configuration language was called TCL. TCL. Some of you may have heard of that. <clears throat> and this big whiteboard we're drawing. You know, here's how we configure the schema. Here's how we configure the transaction. Here's how we configure validation, queries, the user interface, all of it. <clears throat> all a handful of reusable parts and this little tickle code in between. And then we looked at them and we said, wow, you know, if you 
if we just replace the tickle with data, there'd be no application code at all. And it sounds semi crazy, but you know, think about this for a second. You know, if you look at a form on a computer screen right now, if there's <clears throat> if there's five fields on the form, somewhere they have different names and some programmer codes field one to be invoice number and field two is customer number and then they write code to validate customer number and invoice number and then they send it to the database where they put the customer number in cust num one and etc you know well all of that if you just said i'm going to create a general purpose form it just a form composed is composed of n number of fields and, and I have a data structure that says this form contains these fields and each field contains this validation logic and each field is posted to some place in the database. And I hope you can kind of imagine how this goes that that you can literally uh, at least get to about 90% of 90%. In other words, some applications you can do 100% model driven. And some application, you know, so and some 90% model driven, 10% coding, and some some are very, very hard, bespoke, you know. So, you know, but oh, on average, most of everything can be written without any code. Going back to the healthcare.gov, 500 million lines of code can probably be replaced with dozens or thousands of lines of code. I mean, we see this all the time. There, the, uh, the movement that Gartner's talking about, low code, no code, citizen development, is mostly centered around relational database, because that's what's popular now. And, and it's allowing citizen developers to create their own silos faster. I mean, they're proving that this approach is possible, but not really solving the problem. The real problem is uh, simplification and integration. But once you get to that point, um, you know, you just build a model of the various parts of the application, implement a little bit of architecture. That's what our data-centric architecture forum is all about. Uh, and off you go. The reason we have this forum is because we realized five years ago or so that as you make this transition, things that used to rely on an application programmer to do, like authorization, validation, entity resolution, deduplicate, all that stuff is no longer going to be done in application code. It needs to be done in the model. Therefore, you need some architecture to manage the model and manage the engine. So <clears throat> um, the, uh, the primary way that a data center model differs is um, is that it's built on semantics and graph database. That's probably the number one way it differs. Um, there's a handful of examples of them out there. <clears throat> there's a company called Cinchy, C-I-N-C-H-Y, if you wanted to see what this looks like in practice, um, that's probably as good a place you can go as any to, to see this in action. And then finally, we were gonna talk about governance. Um, <clears throat> and I'm gonna kind of pause here for just a second. Um, and, and I'm going to take questions in a minute, but let me just give just a brief idea and we can come back to this. What, um, what happens in traditional database, in traditional data governance, you know, think about it, you're dealing with tens of millions of pieces of metadata. In fact, most people when they sit down and start this initiative have no idea how much metadata there even is, um, but they Play, they, you, know, you get the CDO and you get an army of data stewards, but the stewards aren't really stewards of anything. They're just knowledgeable people in a department that, that know where certain kinds of, which systems and which tables and what these, many of these elements mean. I mean, it's very useful, but they're not actually stewards of, any, of anything. They're just, because it's so complicated, you have to decentralize the understanding of it. And we find, you know, it's it's useful to rely on these people. They they know a lot about 
what the current data is and what it means and all that kind of stuff. The other bizarre thing that happens, and I, the regulators have driven a lot of this, is this idea that there's critical data elements that, that don't try and manage all 10 million pieces of your metadata, although I don't know why you should be managing them all, um, <clears throat> but there's a small number that are really critical. But every place we've been, is mostly banks that do this, but um, every place you've been in, it seems to be some mystery how they anoint um, a small number, meaning hundreds typically, of data elements as being the most crucial. I mean, it's almost like that George Carlin routine where there's seven words you can't say on TV. You know, he, he says there's 400,000 words in the English language, but only seven that you can't say on TV. There must be something incredibly special about those seven. And so it is with these critical data elements, like why did, you know, account number, why is that so critical? You know, and various other, you know, there's just a list and they, and they spend a lot of time, they buy software products and they have people type in, where does this element come from? And which system did it come out of and how good is the quality and all this, but really it's, it's a, such a rear guard action, such a small number. Meanwhile, people are implementing systems faster than anybody can even discover them. Then along, you know, part of data governance, everyone's data cataloging now because everyone's got data sets because everyone has data scientists and machine learning people and they like to deal with data sets. So they extract stuff from legacy systems and put it in a set and put it in their data lake. And then, you know, they spend 60 or 80% of their time figuring out what's the right data set, how to twist it and conform it and augment it so it's ready to, to run through the machine learning algorithm. But all that learning is lost because the next person that comes along starts over again. Um, and then the other thing with, with traditional government, data governance, it's often top-down command and control. Like one of our clients says, don't even use the word data governance because somebody from corporate is going to show up and, and, and spoil everything. What we've seen um, work a lot better, one of our clients coined this term, so we use it now, it it's, creates a consortium. So the consortium is only dealing with hundreds of concepts. They're dealing with this core model that we talked about. And those hundreds of concepts are, are, are the enduring business themes. They don't change that often. So you can you know, have people come together and talk about, and, you know, you're still learning. There's some subtleties and stuff in there. They also typically have thousands of what we call taxonomic distinctions. So, you know, the, the, the difference between, for almost all companies, the difference between male and female is just a categorical difference. You know, the, the handful of companies where they actually have to have different structures and different classes and stuff are like, you know, OBGYN clinics where there's lots of, you know, well, it's mostly women, different sets of questions you'd ask if a, if a guy ever showed up or, you know, like that. There's typically hundreds of kinds of categories, each which have either I have a handful or dozens or hundreds of, of these categorical differences, which don't have to be structural or conceptual differences in the model, but they, you know, they have to be fit in. And the other thing that's different about the consortium is it's, it's sort of a coalition of the willing. You know, you bring, if you want to come to the, co to the consortium, you have to have skin in the game. You have to be actively using the shared model of the, of the, of the enterprise. You have to volunteer. You know, it's not being forced on you. It's really all about carrots rather than sticks. And the carrots are quite incredible. Like you know, one of the clients you worked with, when I was talking earlier about sharing data they even after you do this they have a tough time getting their head around what they just did so one of the first projects we turned you know all their fifty thousand employees into triples you know so we have who they are their phone number all that what what department they're in and and the the chart of accounts and the organizational tree and the cost centers all that stuff that you very often have to have in almost any project and we go several other divisions and one of them needed some HR data. And we said, well, we, it's already there. It's in the graph, you can just use it. Well, you know, we need to convert it. But no, no, it's, 
You don't need a converter. You just attach to it and you're ready to go. No, you know. So, but that's the big carrot. There's all of a sudden a whole bunch of work that everyone's used to doing. Every time you start a project, the first thing is how are we going to get the data and how are we going to convert it to something we can use, you know. So that's the whole thing. I'm going to take another, I'm going to do my wrap up, have QA, but let me get a glass of water in just a second. If you recall, this is what most enterprise architectures look like. Um, there's the main road off there to the right. Right now, there's only about 1% of all firms that are actually on this journey. Um, and it, you know, I think done right, you do it gradually over a long period of time rather than try and launch a giant project. Um, here's some good news and bad news about what I just said. The good news is that it only requires that you change the way you think. Of course, that's the bad news because it's really hard. Um, you know, embracing graph databases, semantics, and model driven, everything. You know, it is possible to become data centric without those things. Um, you know, we, I used to have a questionnaire on the website. So you think you're data centric, you answer all these questions. And of course, everybody got about a 20%, 30% score. This one firm got about an 80%. Wow, is that awesome? So I called them up. I ended up flying out there to meet them. Sure enough, they'd embraced almost everything we say here and had done it kind of the hard way, relational databases and without semantics. So it is possible, but it's very hard. It took them about 20 years. So if you want to get started with this, we have a manifesto out there, the data center manifesto.org and jot that down, go out there. It, it, what, what's, what's really incredible is to read Everybody writes it and they say, a, you know, they say a paragraph or something about why they're in on this. And it's quite interesting to read those before you write your own. Um, there's you know, well over a thousand people out there. Well, there it is, 1,100 people. Um, those dates are wrong, but actually the, we've split the data, this year's data-centric architecture into two pieces. One starts on Monday, the virtual part. So you can still go to our website and sign up for that. <clears throat> um, the other piece, the in-person piece, which is more for architects and practitioners is gonna be late May. Um, my book publisher has a special deal because this sometimes sort of spawns little book clubs. So if you, you can buy four copies of my book and they'll ship you 10, which is an incredible discount. And then you have a bunch to pass to various people you're trying to convince to do this. So there's the forum, there's the books. Let me stop sharing and grab another sip of water because my I was speaking pretty rapidly and I'll take questions. Give me one second. Um, there you have it. So Jen, why don't you ask your question? I think part of the issue, part of the thing that's interesting is writing queries um, is a lot easier. So Jan's question was, uh, um, can any major query tool be used or perhaps none? Um, there's, there's two sort of paths out there right now. There's, there are proprietary graph databases, which are almost always the fastest to get started with the cheapest and, and easiest. And they are like, Neo4j, Titan, Orient, people like that. <clears throat> but we advocate people stick with standards um, because we think this is going to be a long journey. And so, you know, if don't get stuck with one vendor, there's there are many vendors over on the standard side. There's about a dozen graph database vendors that are viable and open source ones and the like. And so on the open standard side, the graph language is called Sparkle, S-P-A-R-Q-L. It has a, probably too much resemblance to SQL. When you first look at it, you think it's the same, but, but actually the difference is in SQL, you spend most of your time in the where clause stitching all the tables together. And in a graph database, it's, it's already stitched together. You're really trying to say what part of the graph do I want to look at or where do I want to aggregate? There's also some in-between languages. There's something called GraphQL. There's something called Hi uh, Cypher. 
Um, a lot of developers like those better because they look closer to a, to what they're used to. Um, but um, you know, we think the the long term path is is with the standards going down that way. Sure, uh, people are just welcome to speak. Uh, probably yep. hear voices there. Um, you know, to me, the whole thing we talked about it before is uh, you know people just don't um, believe it's possible. Can it be true? Yep. 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 It's absolutely true. I mean, it's, it's kind of why less than 1% of all companies are doing this. Now, some people see that as a negative. They don't want to <clears throat> get away from the crowd. But obviously, a small percentage see that as a positive. That's, that's where the advantage lies. So, um... You know, we're moving into a no-code, low-code world. Could you compare what, uh, you know, what, what Semantic Arts does versus, say, Microsoft and their power objects and things? Yeah, so we we don't offer a product. We're purely professional services and consulting. Um, so we're different at, at sort of at that level. Um, and there's no, other than, than Cinchi, who I mentioned, there's no real um, off the shelf offering, no code, low code on a graph database right now. <clears throat> There's people working on it, but so it's, it's at least partially a roll your own right now. Um, it is, you know, it's surprisingly not hugely di difficult to roll your own. You have to think pretty deeply about what you're doing, but, um, and, and there's, there's some other standards that are sort of a starting point. There's a standard called Shackle, S-H-A-C-L. I spelled that wrong, yeah. <clears throat> Which is primarily a standard about um, how to describe the validation you want to do on your data on the way into the graph. But it turns out you can also use that to get a starter set for what are all your forms and tables and like that going to look like because you know, if you know that an employee has to have a social security number, a start date, and a pay rate, if it's going to validate for that, I mean, you might as well put those in the form. All right. Um, I'm really glad you could take time out from your busy schedule. Um, as I said to me, I, it seems fascinating, but it just seems very hard to, you know, to, to become more than that 1%. You know, there's just a tremendous <laughs> amount of resistance <clears throat> Um, yep. And, uh, you know, please uh, turn to, you know, DEMA for different resources. So you can check out our website at DEMA New England. And uh, thank everybody for attending. And I am going to uh, make it available as a recording. Let's see. Okay, that looks like, okay.